Our next key question is, why does Macbeth hallucinate the dagger? Is this a dagger I see before me? It's handled toward my hand? It's as though he's personifying the murder that he's about to commit and saying it's not really within his control, it's being controlled by the dagger. This is a way of not facing up to his own responsibility. He emphasises that again with come let me clutch thee he's having to request permission from the dagger to hold it he tries to control the dagger by showing its inferior status calling it thee but that's contradicted by let me assuming that the dagger has powers that it won't give to macbeth now i want to think about the word clutch this foreshadows the moment when he comes out of Duncan's bedchamber, clutching the two daggers with which he's killed Duncan. He literally cannot let go of them. Lady Macbeth has to force him to give them up. This is the perfect metaphor for Macbeth's bloodlust. It's not just kingship that he wants to hold on to, it's the act of killing. And that's why he uses this word clutch and that's why he envisages the dagger the instrument of murder it's the blood he's attracted to now many people wonder whether the dagger is a kind of supernatural creation from the witches yep is it time yeah can you go get the car i need to wait my shirt's not quite dry sure can well, the next thing I want to draw your attention to is this, the number of syllables. By now, you'll be familiar with Shakespeare's method of conveying that a character is thinking evil thoughts by making them break the iambic pentameter. So there should be 10 syllables per line, but these two lines have 11 syllables and 12, showing the damage that Macbeth is doing to his own psyche, his own conscience, his own mind. He also realises here that this is damage that he is creating himself. That's why he calls it a false creation. And where does this creation come from? He doesn't blame the witches. He doesn't blame Lady Macbeth. No, it comes from the heat-oppressed brain. Well, who is responsible for that heat? Himself. He is not attaching any blame to any other character in the play, or to any supernatural force. In other words, Macbeth understands that he is responsible for his own hamartia. And why heat oppressed? You know, it's not like nagging oppressed from Lady Macbeth, but he's blaming heat. Where have we met heat before? Yes, we met it right at the beginning of the play. That sergeant's description of Macbeth executing his enemies with bloody execution, but his sword smoked. It is the heat of battle. That heat, of course, is from his sword. It's the blood that causes that heat. It comes out hot. So when Macbeth talks about the heat-oppressed brain, it's blood that he has in mind. He knows his hamartia his bloodlust. Again, Shakespeare symbolises the damage that this is causing to Macbeth by giving him another 11-syllable line and disrupting the iambic pentameter. So Macbeth understands, just as the audience does, that he is damaging himself. Now, as he keeps speaking to the dagger, we can see that his obsession with bloodlust changes the dagger's form. So the dudgeon of the, the dagger is this hilt this handle and he is imagining gouts of blood up to the dudgeon so not only is he going to kill duncan but it's going to be a very form of bloody execution but he's expecting that blood to go all the way up here in other words onto his hands and that is the attraction of murdering duncan and notice how in this soliloquy he doesn't talk at all about becoming king. It's as though that's not really on its mind. 
It's the dudgeon and blood that appeals to him. It's the goriness. It's the bloodlust. Now, the next thing we have to consider is how far the witches have influenced him. Well, for a start, Macbeth never refers to the Weird Sisters as witches. They're always the Weird Sisters in his mind. And interestingly, he doesn't say that he's celebrating anything. He says that witchcraft is celebrating pale Hecate's offerings. Now, Hecate is a deliberate reference to a Greek goddess. So what Macbeth is doing here is rejecting Christian teaching, and he's rejecting that way of looking at the world. In fact, he's rejecting God. So he imagines a world, his own world, in which evil is prospering, in which witchcraft is celebrating the offerings of Hecate. But the question is, does he see himself as that offering? Does he see himself as being controlled by Hecate? And the answer was no. We've already seen how the heat-oppressed brain is oppressed by his own heat, his own actions, and his own bloodlust. Now, of course, you can still argue that actually it is the Weird Sisters who are controlling his mind, if you like, but if you do that, you still have to explain that Macbeth himself does not see the world that way and does not see his tragic flaw, his hamartia, that way. He believes he's responsible for his own actions and his own downfall. Next, he personifies murder and imagines it as a historical Roman king called Tarquin. Uh, he says, with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design, moves like a ghost. This is a famous rape scene from Roman literature. So this again is lust. It links directly to Macbeth's bloodlust. He doesn't see his hamartia as an ambition, a desire for power. Tarquin is already a king. It's not about ambition, it's about lust. And that's why he uses this classical reference, because he wants himself, because it's a soliloquy, it's written, it's his own words spoken to himself, he wants to understand his own motive. He knows it's bloodlust. And this changes our perception of the play, because although anyone in the audience is free to interpret it as an attack on the supernatural, once we realise that Macbeth himself does not believe that he's being controlled by the supernatural, but by his own desires, then we ask what has created that. It's not that Macbeth is just some kind of psychopath. It's that society has rewarded this warrior culture, and it has required of, his, of its successful men that they have this quality of bloodlust. This is what's made them successful, because it's a military society based on killing. Now there is another cool reason why Shakespeare chooses this reference to Tarquin, because there were in fact two Tarquins, father and son. So the ravishing Tarquin I've just dealt with is actually the son, but the father was Tarquin the Proud, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus. I just love that, Superbus. It will probably be pronounced Superbus, but I love the idea of a Superbus. Anyway, he was a tyrant. Therefore, Shakespeare is making a parallel with Macbeth, who became king, and you'll love this bit, because his wife, Tulia, persuaded him to assassinate the existing king, her father. Well, this is exactly like Lady Macbeth, isn't it? Who persuades Macbeth to assassinate King Duncan. And then that link with the father is there. She doesn't kill Duncan because... Duncan reminds her of her father. So in this sense, Lady Macbeth is therefore portrayed as better than the historical Tulia. Interesting, isn't it? So Shakespeare here, in this reference, appears not to be blaming Lady Macbeth as much. Who does he blame? Obviously, uh, Tarquin the Proud, and obviously Macbeth in this metaphor. He is 
the tyrant Tarquin the Proud. Now the other allusion, if we go back to Tarquin's son, the one who committed the rape, well, Lucretia, who was raped, commits suicide. There's another parallel with Lady Macbeth. So you can see how he's really tapping into the nobles here because they're the ones who would have had this classical education. Uh, and he's also being really cunning. It's like me interrupting the video now and saying, do you know this video links to Mr. Sally's Ultimate Guide to Macbeth? Go and get it. I'm really annoyed by these three star ratings, by the way. So this person has complained that there's a spelling mistake in it, and so it's only getting one star. Okay, sorry, there's a spelling mistake. I'll try and correct it. So this is actually an advert for his own book, The R Rape of Lucrece, uh, which he'd published in 1594. Now, that was interestingly a plague year, uh, so he dedicated it to the Earl of Southampton, who became his patron, his sponsor, if you like, who therefore paid Shakespeare to write this poem. It's a long poem presented as a book. Now, that is also significant here, because 1605 is also a plague year, and uh, this play is not being performed in the theatres. As a result, they're shut. It's being performed at court, uh, amongst all the nobles. And so, effectively, Shakespeare is saying, hey, guys, would you like a poem written for you and celebrated in print? Like, I'll make one for you. You'll just have to pay me a bit. What a I love the fact that he's a businessman right in the middle of this play. So. Shakespeare is not what he seems here, and I think it's the same parallel with Macbeth. Macbeth seems to be influenced by supernatural powers, but when we see that all his references are classical and not Christian, we can see that he doesn't even believe in supernatural powers. He doesn't even believe in this idea of good and evil and hell and heaven. And also, we come to um, Lucretia's suicide as the victim. That foreshadows Lady Macbeth's suicide. Shakespeare is drawing a parallel with her and saying, hey guys, perhaps Lady Macbeth is a victim. Who's, who's she a victim of? The patriarchal society, which has excluded her from power. So just to be clear, because you're taking notes, aren't you? The allusion to Tarquin and Hecate are pagan references which predate Christianity and therefore Macbeth himself calls Christian belief into question. Obviously Shakespeare himself can't do that because he would be going against the beliefs of his time. So the audience can see this as proof of Macbeth's evil. However, an audience member who didn't believe in God would see it as proof of Macbeth's common sense, at least in terms of his beliefs, if not in terms of his action. So when we look at his actions, we can see that he employs some elements of avoidance. So look at the passive tense here. It's not, I go and I do it and I perform the murder. No, he says, I go and it is done. He can't articulate the fact that he's going to do it. And his language pretends that it's not really him. He also says, the bell invites me. And what he's suggesting there is, well, it's not really my idea, is it? His language denies responsibility, even though he knows he's responsible because he's going to do it. But his language tries to remove that responsibility because he doesn't want the guilt. And perhaps he knows that actually he should not do it. Well, you might say, Mr. Sanders, you've told me that he's not worried about heaven or hell, but he actually mentions it here. He talks about the bell summoning Duncan to heaven or to hell. Well, I've got two things to say about that. Firstly, he just puts these as equal possibilities, as though he doesn't really care which is which. Duncan can go to heaven or to hell. Who cares? It's as though he doesn't really believe in them. If he does believe in them, there's something else that's going on here. Duncan is not the great king that we have been led to believe. So Shakespeare is suggesting that his character is such that he could just as easily go to hell. He's not a good man. 
out of those two interpretations, I favor the fever. I favor the one that balances them. So yeah, he's going to go to heaven or to hell, as though both of those things are equal, and they can only be equal if you don't believe in them. Obviously, if you do believe them, they are diametrically opposite and not equal at all. Heaven has far more power and benefit than hell. And so these are his last words in the scene before he kills Duncan, and I think they explain finally why he goes through with it. It's because Macbeth doesn't believe in the soul and eternal damnation. He doesn't believe that the actions he performs now are going to condemn him for eternity. They are only going to influence what happens in his life now. So you are now an expert in Macbeth's motivation. Check out the next videos in the series, should be up here, or something else that you fancy. See you soon on my channel. Don't forget to subscribe.